from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Potent Biology, Stem Cells, Cloning, and Regeneration, will be given by Dr. Douglas Melton, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Harvard University, and Dr. Nadia Rosenthal, senior scientist at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. The third lecture is titled, Coaxing Embryonic Stem Cells. And now to introduce our program, the Grants Program Director of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Dennis Liu. Good morning, and welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and our topic of uh, stem cells for the 2006 Holiday Lectures on Science. Our speaker this morning is Doug Melton. He's an HHMI investigator at Harvard University. And in his previous lecture, Doug emphasized the essential roles that stem cells play in embryonic development. And understanding development was really Doug's scientific passion. And as also uh, has been mentioned previously, Doug was well aware of the promise of stem cells, but it was actually events in his personal life that led him to refocus his research efforts on stem cells and unleashing their therapeutic potential. Some years ago, he found out that his son and daughter both were afflicted with juvenile diabetes, and this sort of parental passion really changed Doug's research focus. In this lecture, Doug will show how understanding stem cells and developmental biology is key to understanding how to use stem cells to cure and treat human disease. And now a brief in, uh, video to introduce Doug. Yeah, when I was young, I'm not sure I knew I wanted to be a scientist, but I always liked science. I liked the idea that you could ask and try to answer questions about how things worked using experiments. I found them fun and interesting. And I have vague recollections as a young boy being interested in how eggs made animals. Like how could a frog egg make a frog and a salamander egg make a salamander and yet the eggs look the same. I just found that puzzling. And then sort of by accident I ended up working on frogs for the first part of my career for my PhD and when I came here to Harvard I worked on early frog development. I'm really lucky to have a wonderful group of colleagues to work with me here and they range from people who already have a PhD and an MD or, or both, a PhD or an MD, um, people who are graduate students studying for a PhD but also undergraduates. My lab has in the summers usually about seven or eight undergraduates who are fully engaged in the research with us. And it's also a fun place to be because we have people literally from all over the world, people interested in stem cells and possible treatments for diabetes um, have agreed to join us here and I really like that. So it makes uh, lunchtime conversation a lot of fun. I think that what I would say to a high school student thinking about science is if you want to do something in your life that can literally change the world, there aren't that many options. Modern biomedicine has made enormous progress treating some specific human conditions, but on the whole, the major degenerative diseases have not been effectively attacked yet. Therefore, there's the possibility of working in areas like stem cell biology where there's a completely different approach to treating the disease that could make a huge difference. So science offers enormous opportunity for young people to do things that are fun and important at the same time. Good morning again. I'm pleased to be back to tell you about a fun part of stem cell biology today. And I'm going to make two points. The first is to talk about how to use stem cells to make spe specialized parts of the body, particular kinds of cells like a nerve cell or a muscle cell or a, an insulin producing cell. And obviously the object there is to not only learn how cells specialize during development, but also to look forward to the possibility of new treatments for people that suffer from diseases where these cells are missing. In the second part, I'm going to combine cloning with stem cell biology to talk about a sort of future in biomedicine, in my view, a way where one can move the study of degenerative diseases 
from patients, where it's obviously quite difficult to study, to move it from a patient into a petri dish to try to find new drugs to treat degenerative diseases. Now, you'll note that I use the word cloning in that second part. And generally, when I say cloning, people don't think about making genetically identical copies of cells. That's not the first thing that comes to mind. When I say cloning, you think, no doubt, about cloning animals. So here are some animals that have been cloned in laboratories. And I'm going to start off today by talking about cloning, why it was done, and what we've learned from it, and then how we can use that technique for stem cell biology. There you see a few pictures of animals, clones of animals. And if you think about what cloning involves, it is a process where we're kind of turning back the clock on specialized cells. We talked yesterday about cells becoming ever more restricted in their fates. And you might remember this picture where we talked about going from a fertilized egg to a gradual process of cells turning some genes on and others off, giving rise eventually to an adult animal. So cloning then means that somehow one is taking these fully specialized cells and putting them all the way back to the beginning, not going from left to right in this slide, but instead from right to left. How can that be done? Well, the first hint that that might be possible is something that you might know yourself, and that is many people commonly take little clippings from plants and then grow a whole other plant from it. If you see a begonia or some type of plant you like, often you'll take a clipping and it'll be rerooted and grow a whole other plant. In fact, the first part of cloning science really began from those observations. And the first clone of a whole organism from a single cell was done in a plant. Not a very exciting plant, you could say. It's not my favorite, the carrot. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. it was possible to take a single cell. Uh, Stewart did this in the 1950s and grow an entire carrot plant from a single root cell. You see there on the right, the flask has this whole carrot plant grown in it. It's sort of amusing to note that in animal biology, we use serum to grow cells in culture. I'm always pleased to remember that in the case of growing carrot cells, they use coconut milk as the sort of serum to grow cells in culture. And here you see then this full plant grown from a single cell. I also am reminded here that the word clone, the Greek word clone, means twig, which again relates to the plant biology of making a copy of something. But the real excitement in this area probably came from when scientists decided to test whether it would be possible to not just clone plants, but to clone animals, in particular, more complex animals, vertebrates. And that work was done decades ago by Briggs and King and separately by John Gurdon and their colleagues. And I'm going to describe that experiment for you now. It's an experiment called nuclear transplantation, testing whether a cell in its nucleus and all of its genes has the capacity to do something else. So here then the question is, if one considers an adult cell, a fully differentiated cell, be it a muscle, a nerve, or blood cell, can that cell, or does that cell have within it the genetic information to make the rest of the organism? Or has that information been lost during normal development? In this case, the cell that was used was a fully differentiated cell from the intestine. And this picture here shows the nucleus from an intestinal cell being removed or sucked up into an injection pipette. That nucleus is then being placed in a different cell, a cell that might have the capacity to reprogram or reorganize the genes in a way that they could be uh, tested for their ability to make other kinds of cells. Obviously, then, the host for that transplantation is going to be an egg, an unfertilized egg. And as shown here, the unfertilized egg has to have its own nucleus removed. In this case, it's removed by inactivating it with ultraviolet irradiation. That's the little squiggly lines at top. Then one takes the nucleus from an intestinal cell, injects it into this unfertilized or enucleated egg. And the question is, what does that reconstructed cell do? If the nucleus only had the capacity to make intestinal cells, one might expect that as it divided, it would just make more and more cells like the intestine the nucleus might only have the information left to make the intestine. But in fact, as you know, it can go on, in this case, and make a normal embryo, first forming a blastula, like the blastocyst we spoke about.